Hello. This week's Torah portion, Shemini, includes the middle of the Torah. Both the middle letter, Dovav in Gachon, and the middle words, Darosh Darash. The middle letter comes after the middle words, so there are more long words in the second half of the Torah than in the first. Also, the two sides of the scroll weigh about the same, which makes lifting the scroll during services, Had Baha, easier. Among other things, we read about unkosher animals. Quote, and the hair, although it chews its cuds, has no two hoofs, so it is unclean for you. Unquote. So the hair is not kosher. What more can we say about it? This, when King Ptolemy made rabbis translate the Bible into Greek, an opus known as the, as the Septuagint, they made some changes to avoid unintended insults or misconceptions. The Talmud says, quote, and in listing unclean animals, instead of writing the hare, Arnevet, they wrote the short-legged beasts, Seirat Haraglai, because Ptolemy's wife was named Arnevet, and they were afraid the king would say, the Jews have mocked me and inserted my wife's name in the Torah. Therefore, they refer to the hair only by one of its characteristics. The Septuagint was written about 250 BCE. Let us briefly recall its history from the Talmud. Quote, there was an incident involving King Ptolemy of Egypt, who assembled 72 elders of Israel and put them into 72 rooms and did not tell them why, so they would not coordinate their responses. He approached each and every one of them and said to each of them, write for me a translation of the Torah of Moses, your teacher. The Holy One, blessed be he, placed wisdom in their hearts and they all tacitly agreed on one common understanding. They wrote for him as follows. Instead of Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created, they wrote Elohim bara Bereshit, God created in the beginning. To avoid the misinterpretation, Bereshit created God and the mistaken conclusion that there are two powers and the first, Bereshit, created the second, God. Instead of let us, make, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, they wrote, I shall make man in image and in likeness. To avoid using the plural, which might lead to the mistaken conclusions that there are many powers and that God has human form. Instead of, and on the seventh day, God concluded his work, they wrote, and on the sixth day, God concluded his work, and he rested on the seventh day. To avoid the mistaken conclusion that God completed some of his work on Shabbat itself. Instead of male and female, he created them, they wrote, male and female, he created him. To avoid the mistaken conclusion that this contradicts the earlier verse, and God created man. Instead of, come, let us go down, and there confound their language, they wrote, come, let me go down, and there confound their language, to avoid the mistaken conclusion that there are many gods. Instead of, and Sarah laughed within herself, Bekirba, they wrote, and Sarah laughed among her relatives, Bikroveha. This was to distinguish between Sarah's laughter, which God criticized, and Abraham's laughter, to which no reaction is recorded. The change implies that Sarah's laughter was offensive because it happened in the presence of others. Instead of, for when they are angry, Simeon and Levi slay men, and when they are pleased, they maim oxen, they wrote, for when they're angry, they maim oxen, and when they are pleased, they are put a trough to avoid the implication that they were murderers. Instead of, and Moses took his wife and his sons and set them, upon, set, set them upon a donkey, they wrote, and Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon a carrier of people to create the implication that it may have been a horse or a camel rather than a lowly donkey. Instead of, and the children of Israel resided in Egypt for 430 years, they wrote, and the children of Israel resided in Egypt and other lands for 400 years to avoid the mistaken conclusion that they lived in Egypt continuously that long. Instead of, and he sent the youth of the children of Israel who brought burnt offerings, they wrote, and he sent the elects, Zaratutei, 
of the children of Israel to avoid the question of why young men were sent to perform that service. Similarly, they later, they later replaced and upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hands with, and upon the elect of the children of Israel, he laid not his hands. Instead of Moses saying, I have not taken one donkey, Hamor, from them, they wrote, I have not taken one item of value, Hamid, from them, to avoid the impression that Moses may have taken other items. Instead of which the Lord your God has allotted to all the nations, when referring to worship of the sun and the moon, they wrote, which the Lord your God has allotted to give light to all the nations, to avoid the mistaken conclusion that God gave the heavenly bodies to the Gentiles so they could worship them. And finally, instead of God saying, and worship the sun or the moon or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded, they added, which I have not commanded to serve them, to make it clear that it does not mean that these entities created themselves and that God did not command their existence. And of course, the reaction was swift. The sages did not want the Torah translated. The Talmud says, quote, the day the Torah was translated into Greek was as ominous for Israel as the day on which the golden calf was made because the Torah could not be accurately translated. They even decreed that the day the Septuagint was completed, the eighth of Tevet, will be marked on the Jewish calendar as a day of darkness. Quote, on the eighth of Tevet, which was written in Greek in the days of King Ptolemy, darkness came to the world for three days. It is now included in the reasons for fasting on the 10th of Tevet, which commemorates the breaching of the walls of Jerusalem. The reasons why translations were not welcome were accuracy, as stated above, and avoiding creating weapons for anti-Semites and founders of new religions. For example, Isaiah 714 refers to an Alma or a young girl the Hebrew word for a virgin is betula, but the Greek word for both is the same. This led Christians three centuries later to understand it as virgin and claim proof of their religion and of the virgin birth. Beyond the Bible, Talmud translations have been few and far between, partial and sometimes edited. Detractors had to rely on apostate Jews such as Pablo Cristiani in the infamous disputation forced on Nachmanides. Translations opened the door for anti-Semites to misquote the Talmud or quote it out of context. There's an unwritten rule that commentaries must be written in Hebrew in order to endure. An exception was made for Aramaic, the language of the Talmud, because Aramaic is very close to Hebrew. Most of all, it was felt that the Septuagint opened the door for Greek culture into Judaism, and in general for Jews to identify with the culture of their birth land, even more so than fellow residents who are not Jewish. The Jews indeed tended to out-German the German, out-Spanish the Spaniards, and out-French the French. Yet translations were not always, always unwelcome. When the Torah writes about the heap of witness, it uses an Aramaic word, which it quickly translates into Hebrew. Quote, Laban named it Yegar Sahaduta, but Jacob named it Galet. Also, the Torah says in stating the commandment of Tefillin, and you shall bind them as a sign upon your hands, and they shall be for frontlets between your eyes. In the Talmud, Rabbi Akiva explains that the word totafot is extracted from two other languages and means that the tefillin must have four compartments. Quote, the word tats in the Kapti language means two and the word pats in the Afriki language also means two. So totafot is a compound word meaning four. Beyond the Torah, the book of Daniel was written in Aramaic. Sanhedrin, the name of the supreme legal council of the Jews in Talmudic times, derives from a Greek word meaning assembly. Further, the Torah says, quote, and on those stones you shall inscribe every word of this Torah very clearly. On the other side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook 
to expound this Torah to the children of those who took part in the Exodus. Rashi, based on the Midrash, explains that this was done in the 70 languages of the nations of the world. Rabbi Moshe Greenwald from 19th century Hungary believes Moses' exposition was for Jews only and that he taught Torah in 70 language in anticipation of the exile and the diaspora among the nations. Some say that only outside the land of Israel, they were in Moab at the time, is there a need for explaining Torah in a language other than Hebrew, the holy tongue. Also, the sages ruled that most prayers may be recited in the vernacular. The Mishnah says, quote, these are recited in any language, the Shema, the Amida, the grace after meals, and these are recited only in the sacred tongue, Hebrew. First, the priestly benediction, because it says, thus shall you bless the people of Israel, saying to them, etc., etc. And the recitation at the Halitza ceremony. The verse in the Torah portion also discuss, discusses Halitza, stating, and she shall speak and say, and below it states, and the Levites shall speak and say, just as there the Levites speak in the sacred tongue, so to hear the recitation is in the sacred tongue. On the Shema, the Talmud elaborates, quote, what is the reason to allow saying it in foreign languages? It is stated here, O Israel, which implies it must be understood. Therefore, the Shema may be recited in any language one can hear and understand. Indeed, the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, written in the 16th century, permits saying prayers in any language, while illustrating a variety of opinion. Quote, it is possible to pray in any language when, playing with the, when praying with the congregation. However, praying alone should only be in the holy tongue. However, some say that this is only if one is asking something for himself, not for the regular liturgy. And some say that even for the regular liturgy, one may pray in any language, unquote. But the Mishnah Berura, written in 19th century Poland, warns that this should not become a habit. Jews are always strongly encouraged to learn Hebrew and pray in it. Maimonides writes, quote, all blessings may be recited in any language, provided that the form instituted by the sages is followed, unquote. In other words, translations must be accurate and not creative or poetic. In conclusion, Judaism slowly accepted the translation of all its sources and liturgy into other languages. The original concerns remain, inaccuracies, providing ammunition for anti-Semites, providing springboards for other religions to appropriate and twist the meaning of Jewish rituals, opening the door to assimilation, by validating the input of other cultures into Judaism, etc. Nevertheless, it was felt that Jews must learn their tradition, even if they don't do it in Hebrew, and must not create the impression they are hiding something. Shabbat Shalom.